probably a bad idea. Amen. Well, glory. I had to teach the people in Mexico that the service starts when you hear pastors say, well, glory, <laughs> glory. It doesn't work. You have to say, Gloria, Gloria Dio. But it only took me about a, two services to get them warmed up so that they knew it was time to start. Amen. Well, I was uh, minding my own business in the Hotel Collins just outside of Nasa over into the DF, Distrito Federal. Uh, it's right next door to the Capitol, you see. And uh, I can't remember what I thought I was doing, but uh, the Lord took me back to Luke 17. Isn't that a shock? So let's go back to Luke 17. And I want to begin reading with the 11th verse. This is one very discreet story dropped right in the middle of all the other stuff Jesus was talking to folks about. And I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this story over the years. And I'm going to eke a little more out tonight. He said, now it happened, in verse 11, that he went to Jerusalem. As he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. If you look at the map, that was the way to go. If you didn't want to go the long way around, if you went to get to Jerusalem from where they were, you needed to go through Samaria. Not, that was not always the, the best way to go. Kind of like going through Nasa. You know, not everybody there is a Christian. Amen. And not a, very few people in Samaria were, were uh, uh, practicing Jews. But it says, He entered a certain village, and there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. Because, you know, they had to stand afar off. They were required to stay away from folks because God knew he didn't want people catching whatever they had. So they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Where were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. The King James says your faith has made you whole. Glory to God. Now, I've preached on a couple of things out of this passage for a number of years. One of them is, you know, that they were healed as they went. Amen. So we I stole it off of somebody, but, but I thought it was a good thing. They said, uh, you know, that, that they didn't get healed. He didn't just run over and lay hands on them, and they just immediately were healed. They were healed as they went. They were in the process of doing something while the healing took place. And uh, we, we named that process Winting. Amen. Between that time when you say amen and, you, and your leprosy disappears, you're winting. Amen. So, so we could preach a pretty good sermon on winting because most of us have winted before, haven't we? Amen. You stay in faith and you just keep on winting until you see something happen. Amen. But, uh, and then I preached something about going back and giving glory to God. You know, you ought to have a grateful heart. Jennifer touched on that. Uh, I just uh, I got stuck on gratitude here last week. Uh, as I was studying for these meetings that we did this last week. and uh, All of the prayers in the New Testament uh, are just centered around gratitude to God. Because Just think about that. The God of the universe hears you when you pray. Come on now. Amen. If that don't get you excited, you haven't, you haven't really understood it yet. <laughs> Amen. So uh, that's a pretty big deal. Go back and thank the man for heaven's sake. I thank the lady at the restaurant for bringing me water. It seemed like I'd thank God for giving me life and health and and refer, you know, come on, amen. But uh, I, as I was reading over it, uh, sitting on that hard bed in the Hotel Collins there in Nasa, I, uh, I saw a couple of things I hadn't seen before. I know that seems impossible to you, uh, but uh, I've been reading this story for 30-something years, and uh, there were a couple of things in there that never jumped out at me before. 
But uh, I thought I'd share some of those things tonight. First of all, did you notice that lepers tend to hang out together? And they're identified together by their affliction. Amen. Now, we know that they weren't all Samaritans. How do we know that? Because Jesus said, did none come back to give glory to God except this foreigner? We're not ten cleansed? Right? So Jesus is telling us there were some other nationalities, probably Jews, that were in that crowd. But once you became a leper, you know, the Jews didn't want you around. They did the Samaritans. So you hang out with the other lepers. <laughs> Amen. Well, I got to thinking about that. I said, ain't that the truth? We have a tendency to covey up according to our affliction, don't we? Why? Because we all like to get together and complain. <laughs> we like to hang out with people of common interests, for sure. Uh, we particularly like to get together with people that agree with us. Amen. Amen. I, I, was, uh, I was serving in a church a number of years ago as a Bible school director, and uh, the assistant pastor and I were going downtown wasn't in Tucson, so you don't have to try to think who it was. And uh, we were in his car. I thought I was going to have to walk home because I don't like to ride with idiots. Uh, we were, we were talking, and because I'm going to, we're going to the Bible bookstore, you know, the Christian bookstore, because he was going to get something for the church. And I, there was a book I was looking for. So I, remember books? I don't have any here. Yeah, I do. They kind of look like this. They made out of paper, all held together. Okay. Amen. That's what, that, that's what we did before we had these. And uh, this was back in that ancient day, back in the 90s. And uh, so anyway, we were on our way to the Bible bookstore. And uh, I, I told him the book I was looking for. He said, oh, I've never heard of that guy. I said, really? And I t started talking about it. And he said, well, does he, he believe like Brother Hagin? Does he believe like this, that, and the other? I said, not really. He said, well, why are you reading it? He said, I never read anything by somebody I don't agree with. I said, think that all the way through for a minute. That means from this day until you die, you're never going to learn anything else. You will never, ever have any more knowledge than you've got today, you doofus. I didn't say that, but I thought that. Amen. Amen. I knew right then that my relationship with that particular organization was going to be short-lived. Amen. Because his daddy was the pastor, so I figured, uh-oh. You probably learned that from somebody. Amen. But we have a tendency to hang around with people that we know agree with us about everything and that aren't going to hold us accountable uh, for our, our uh, derelictions. Amen. So these guys were all ostracized together and shared a common malady. And I thought that that's good information for us to have because it allows us to understand that we can target specific groups based on their infirmity. Because they covey up around their weaknesses and we have the answer for whatever it is that ails them. Amen. So we can tailor our approach to people if we know what their common denominator is. Are you listening to me? So I thought that's good information to have right there. It said then that, that these fellows who were all lepers lifted up their voice. You know, I mean, you can teach on faith out of this passage, all right, but these boys were appealing on a corporate level. This was not an individual asking the Lord to heal them. This was uh, ten guys coming together and crying out apparently with one voice and their cry was have mercy on us they said Jesus master have mercy on us the word master there's only used by Luke in his gospel about five times it's not used anywhere else in the Bible it's not Lord like we think of it it's somebody who's a teacher or somebody under whose who's, uh, teaching or ministry or, or auspices we, we are sub submitting ourselves to learn something so they, they were indicating they wanted to learn something from it uh, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Uh, they called him Master and appealed to his mercy. They didn't appeal to, uh, we, we believe that uh, God is a healer. They said, we want to, you to heal us because you're merciful to us. Think about that for just a minute. Their appeal was to his mercy. Amen. How many of you know God is merciful? Aren't you glad to know that? Uh, Psalm 145, the 8th verse says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. Aren't you glad he's great in mercy? I like that. He's not just pretty good at it. He's great in mercy. Amen. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies 
are over all his works. Amen. I like that. He's great in mercy. They're not asking him to do something based on their great faith. They're making a corporate appeal to his nature. I want you to think about that for just a minute. They're willing to throw themselves on the mercy of the Lord. You heard throwing yourself on the mercy of the court. You come in and say, you know, I did it, but I have kids at home I need to take care of. Can you cut me some slack? Amen. They're approaching the Lord Jesus saying, you know, we don't deserve this. We don't even claim to deserve this, but have mercy on us. Amen. Well, that, uh, that kicks a particular button in the Lord. Why? Because he's great in mercy. Amen. I mean, uh, we know he has abundance of everything, but he's particularly great in mercy. So they made an appeal to him based on his nature, not their works or even his standards. Aren't you glad that his response to that was to tell these boys how to get healed? He sho Jesus shows us the nature of God in everything that he did, everything that he uh, uh, participated in while he was on the earth. He said, remember, he said to Philip in John the 14th chapter on the night before his uh, crucifixion, uh, Philip said, you know, just show us the Father and it would suffice us. Remember that? Yeah. And I always picture Jesus going, I love the next sentence. He says, have you been with me this long, Philip? <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm dying tomorrow, and you're still asking dumb questions like that. <laughs> that would be discouraging as a leader, wouldn't it? I'm turning this thing over to you tomorrow, and you what? You don't even know who I am. Amen. <laughs> I've been with you so long, Philip. And you don't know if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So Jesus reveals to us the nature of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1, the first three verses, a great treatise on the express image of God. And that he's speaking to us in this hour by his Son. Hallelujah. If you can see Jesus, then you can get a good clue as to what God looks like. God looks like mercy. Amen. Lord, have mercy on me. It's an appeal to his very nature. Hallelujah. Now, if we know his nature, even when we lack faith or knowledge of a specific promise of some kind, are you ever in that boat where you feel like your boat's sinking and you can't find the promise about plugging the hole in the boat? Amen. You're whipping through there in your modified concordance in the back of your book or else you dropped your tablet in the water and it's not working. Amen. So you don't know specifically what the promise is. But thank God he is great in mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. I know How many of you had to pray this once in a while? I know I got myself in this mess, but I really need you to get me out of it. Ever been there? Yeah, that's about 90% of my praying right there. Lord, I messed this up. Help! Come on. Amen. Hell. Amen. Have mercy on me. Glory. We can make an appeal to him in any situation, not based on our own works, our own greatness, our own intelligence, and not even our own great faith, but just our own intimate knowledge of the nature of our Father. Lord, have mercy on me me. Glory to God. Turn to somebody and say, thank God for His mercy. God for his mercy. Amen. Amen. You know, most people are a little slow because they think of God in all kinds of different ways, but, but uh, many of you have heard, I should have done that song tonight. I thought I was going to, I forgot about it. For the Lord is good and His mercy endureth forever. Psalm 136, every verse in Psalm 136 ends with that sentence. Amen. He, goes, he starts at the very beginning of time and starts listing the wonderful works of God. And every verse says, For the Lord is good and His mercy endureth forever. Now, I'm well convinced that that is God's favorite song. <laughs> well, how do you know it's God's favorite song? Well, He apparently requests it a lot. 
If you go back to the dedication of the temple, when Solomon dedicated the temple in Jerusalem, and said the, all the priests came, you know, and got, came into the temple, and all they, they brought out the singers, hundreds of singers and trumpet players and tambourine beaters and all kinds of things. And they began, when they got all the whole assembled multitude there, what did they sing? For the Lord is good, and His mercy endureth forever. Amen. Amen. So at the dedication of the temple, the first great building built uh, to exalt the Lord our God in the earth, that temple was dedicated with those words. Glory to God. And then later, when the, the whole thing was about to blow up, amen, and uh, the, the three armies were coming down on, on Jerusalem. Remember that? And so the king called all together, and uh, they had the prophet came, you know, and prophesied over them because they were going to be destroyed. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Anybody ever uh, had to pray that prayer? Help me, Jesus. What are we going to do? Amen. And Jesus, uh, the Lord had this wonderful idea. He said, here's what I want you to do. The three armies are coming. They're going to surely kill you all, but here's the best thing you can do. Put the choir in front of the army. Amen. Amen. Put the choir in front of the army. Put the army behind the choir and start marching in the direction of the enemy. Remember that story? Amen. Amen. So uh, they did exactly that. They put the choir in front of the army and started marching toward the enemy, singing. What did they sing? Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good, and His mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah. And uh, maybe my favorite is in Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was in the prison, locked up in the, in the lowest prison. Some people say that he was in the mud, in the bottom of the prison, that there the, was just a mud floor, and the water would run down there, and you, you had to sit in the mud all day. Amen. We got it easy, don't we? We got padded chairs. Jeremiah's sitting in the mud in the prison. Amen. And he had a vision. He saw down through the centuries. He said he saw the day when the children of God once, would once again be in the temple in Jerusalem and that the saints of God would come from all directions, not just the Jews anymore, but that there'd be saints coming from all around the world from every race and kingdom. Hallelujah. That would be us. And said that, that that day would come and the glory of God would illuminate the temple and all the saints of God would be singing one more time. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good and His mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah. So if you just only had those three openings, you'd think it was probably on his at least top ten list. But when they reconstituted the temple in Jerusalem and Ezra came to read the law to him uh, about the restoration of temple worship, he said, uh, uh, we need to sing a little tune here. Somebody call a, a zither player. <laughs> Amen. And uh, what did they sing? Guess what they sang? Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good and His mercy endureth forever. I'm beginning to think now that He likes this tune. Amen. So, uh, of all the things he could have had them over and over again, you go through the Psalms and find a number of Psalms that start that way. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. You get to Psalm 136, and it's in every verse. You know, after a while you're thinking, I think he's trying to make a point here. Come on. Amen. Yeah, you read all those things, and you begin to think, wow, aren't you glad he didn't say, praise the Lord, for he's really angry with sinners, he's going to crush them like bugs. Well, you go to some churches, that's kind of what it sounds like, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, no. Praise the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endureth forever. That's why He kept putting it in there, because when you put something in a song, it stays with you. And so He put that in a song over and over and over and over and over and over. Why? So when times get tough, and you start to think, what am I going to do? And that little song pops up in your heart. You can say, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good, and His mercy endures forever. Glory to God. If you can't think of anything else to do, the next time you're uh, struck with financial fear, the next time uh, physical symptoms come up on your body, and you just can't remember where that stripes deal was found. <laughs> Amen. And you can't remember whether it was in Philemon or Philippians about that needs met thing, you know. But you can remember the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. 
Lord, have mercy on me. Amen. Glory to God. It's an appeal not to your faith, not to your knowledge, not to your beauty, not to your intelligence, but to the essence of the nature of God. Hallelujah. Amen. That'll help you if you'll get hold of it. Now notice, after they said that, he didn't say, well, be healed. He said, go show yourself to the priest. Now, we could go into a lot of detail there, but in Leviticus 14, there's specific instruction in the Old Testament what a leper should do when he thinks he's healed. He has to go to the priest and get his scabs inspected. I'm glad I'm not a priest. I can tell you that right now. You come in and ask me to inspect your scabs, I'm sending you somewhere else. I can tell you that now. So don't even come, all right? Just forget about it. Go see your mama or somebody. I don't want to see them. Amen. But that was what they were supposed to do, is go to the priest, and the priest would inspect and make sure the leprosy's gone but for the safety of the community, you know. That was the point. But uh, Jesus tells them to do what they would do as Jews, because he's got a bunch of Samaritans in here too, right? But uh, he said, what, what would be a good Jewish response to believe in you were healed? You'd go show yourself to the priest. And then they were healed as they went. Well, I got to thinking about that for just a minute. And, of course, I'm a, I, you know, people say stuff, and then we just preach it like, we, like it's true. Because it's people we respect, people, you know, we have uh, uh, some reverence and, and appreciation for their life and ministry, so they say something. And, well, it must be true. They wouldn't lie to me. No, but they could be wrong. You know, being wrong is not lying. <laughs> Amen. It's just being wrong. Amen. I've heard people all my walk with the Lord since I got into this whole uh, faith deal anyway uh, say, you know, when God heals people, He just heals them. You know, just stand in faith, bless God, receive your healing. That's the way that is. Amen. But that's not what the Bible said. It said as they went, they were cleansed. And where did they go? They went where Jesus told them to go when they appealed to Him for their healing. And I got to looking at other instances of Jesus healing people. There are lots of places where instead of just saying, okay, you're healed. I mean, He could have, you'd think. I mean, He's the Son of God after all. But He didn't do that. He told them to do something. You know, I'll tell you what. I see you're blind, all right. How about if I spit here and make some mud, slap it on your eyes, and then you, still blind, make your way down to the pool of Siloam and watch? <laughs> Do what? What's the matter with you? Come on. I mean, didn't he? I mean, think about that poor guy. I mean, we have to assume Jesus is merciful, so he probably knew the way to the pool of Siloam, but he's still blind. This could be a challenge. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that just getting over the idea that the man just spit in my eye would be a challenge. <laughs> you know, you, can you imagine? He's there. Remember, he can't see, you know. He, can, he wants to be healed, right? And Jesus goes, <laughs> I mean, think about it for a minute. Can you imagine what's going through this guy's head? Oh, my God. <laughs> but he gave him instructions, didn't he? And he did. He went down to the pool of Siloam, another place of, of another leper. In uh, Matthew, the, uh, Matthew's Gospel, the 8th chapter, there was another single leper that came to him, and he told him to go to the priest, all right, uh, but he told him to go to the priest and offer the sacrifices prescribed by the law. Similar instructions, but a little different. You know, you can't copy what somebody else did. Are you listening to me? You can't. When somebody else says, well, you know, I gave away my car and God gave me a limousine. You can't just go out and give away your car because Billy Bob did his. I mean, you can, but you're not, you're not, God's not obligated to do anything for you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. So we've got to be careful about it. You can make sure you heard God and not just copied somebody who gave their testimony. You need to get over on the Word. Amen. And then listen to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because God will speak to you and tell you what to do in order to uh, receive your healing. So well, why did He do that? I have no idea. You will have to ask Him. But His mother, remember in the story in, in John chapter 2, uh, when they ran out of wine down at the, at the uh, wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, Jesus performed His first miracle being a moonshiner bootlegger 
made a little wine for Mama. Apparently, Mama needed a drink. I don't know, but she she came and and told uh, asked Jesus what he was going to do about that, and he said, "It's not my time yet." And she didn't bother. You know how your Mama is, don't you? She don't care what you say. She's going to do whatever she's going to do, and she expects you to get with it. <laughs> I don't know about your Mama, but that was mine. <laughs> she's very gracious about it, but she's going to do what she's going to do. You know. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, and, but she turns to the, to the fellows there that are the stewards in the feast, you know, and she says, and she gives the best advice anybody ever gave anybody into the history of the world. She said, whatever he says to you, do it. Amen. I can never give anybody any better advice than that sentence. Whatever he says to you, do it. Amen. And so now think about those boys. They got this woman. I don't know what they, well, how much they knew about her. You know, she was just a guest at the dinner. They're out of wine, all freaking out, you know. And uh, she comes along and says, this is my boy, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And his next instruction is to take those pots and go down and fill them with water. Those were ceremonial pots. You're not supposed to fill them with just any kind of water, you know. He said, go fill them with water. And so they did, and they brought them back and said, uh, have, the, have the head guy at the feast, have him, have him taste the, what's in the pot. Now, if I'm one of those guys that's, uh, that's running after the water, I'm thinking, what in the world? You know, <laughs> but he gets there and they dip in there and he dips it out and sure enough it's wine as a matter of fact he said that's good stuff amen but uh, how did that happen I mean you're thinking it's Jesus he's the son of God couldn't he have just said wine be but he didn't he had to incorporate some think about that he had to get some other people to join in for the miracle sometimes that's the hard part ain't it get some other folks in the miracle with you and get them to carry pots Amen. You want me to do what? Put water in the pot. How's that going to help the wine situation? Just trust me. Yeah, right. Come on. We come to Jesus for healing, not questioning his will. Amen. But leave room for his means and methods. I've had so many people tell me, you know, well, I prayed and believed God, and I'm just that I believe I received, you know. Well, you need to be listening to what the Lord tells you to do. I can't tell you all the different times he's told me to do strange little things in order to, to receive what he had for me. I never question his will in the matter. Amen. I never question whether it's done and settled in heaven. But sometimes there's some things that have to... I don't know why he had to send them to the priest. I don't know why the blind man had to have mud on his eyeballs. I, I have no clue. But for some reason or the other, the Lord thought that was the appropriate step for that particular individual in that situation. And he knows you just as well as he did them. Amen. I remember one time he told me to quit drinking iced tea. I had horrible kidney problems. Pain. I'm in terrible pain. I'm praying, confessing, waving my arms, shouting, you know, all the things they teach you to do. Ain't nothing happening. I still hurt. <laughs> and then all that little still, small voice, you know, says, quit drinking the iced tea. I did, and guess what? Ain't had no pain since. Go figure. Amen. Well, yeah, I had to lose my citizenship in Oklahoma because you can't live in Oklahoma. <laughs> but it was worth it to not have your back hurt all the time. You know what I'm saying? Amen. But what's the point? Pray, believe, you receive. But then right in the middle of the testing of your faith, listen to the Holy Ghost. Amen. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 talks about uh, in the middle of that testing and trial that we need to rejoice. Remember that? Count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Remember that? When patience has its perfect work, you will be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. We usually stop right there. The next verse says, if any of you lacks wisdom, verse 5, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, but ask in faith nothing wavering. That's verse 6. Amen. He didn't stop at verse 4 about you'll be perfect and entire lacking nothing. He said, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. So if, if I pray, believe I receive, do everything I know to do, standing on the Word of God, and, uh, and I don't see anything going on, then I'm listening. Lord, I need some wisdom here. I still hurt. Amen. I've had the Lord tell me to go to the doctor. Some people don't believe that. Well, you don't believe it, but I feel a lot better. <laughs> Amen. Go sit in the corner and play your little judgment if you want to. I'm getting well. <laughs> Amen. 
I've also had the Lord tell me, don't go to the doctor. But the, the, the problem is most people don't pay any attention. They just do whatever they're going to do and then blame God for not getting what they prayed for. Amen. The problem with that is God gets the blame. Amen. If, if, uh, if you follow God, he'll always get the glory, not the blame. Are you listening to me? Yes. Amen. So, if we go on down in that passage, Jesus asked a couple of rhetorical questions. Weren't there ten cleans? Well, everybody knew there were ten cleans. We just got through reading it, right? And then he asked this question. I, I love this question. He said, where are the nine? You ever stop to think about that question? Where are the nine? I ask that question a lot. I do. He said, well, all ten of them got cleansed. What happened to the other nine? There's only this one guy came back. What happens to people who get what they ask for, blessed of the Lord, and then never go back? What is that about? Amen. They never give God the glory. They never submit and commit. And they never express their gratitude. What happens to the nine? They all got cleansed. Where are the nine? I, I, I got stuck on that question for a whole day. Where are the nine? I mean, do you know one of the nine? I know more than nine, I think. What happened to them? Where did they go after the glorious day of deliverance? I've been in meetings where, uh, I mean, people get just supernaturally, spectacularly delivered. And, uh, you know, two weeks later, you don't know where they went. They're so grateful, oh, glory to God, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. And out the door, you know. Hey, what is that about? I don't get it. I, actually, I do get it. I shouldn't say that. Sometimes I guess I've been part of the nine, I suppose. Sometimes people get sucked back into their religious tradition. Yeah. Yeah. I'd worked with a lady in Oklahoma City years ago. She was a devout Catholic. I'm talking devout. I'm talking candles and kneeling things in the house. You know, that, that, that kind of people. Pictures of Jesus and Mary on the wall and all that stuff. And uh, she got some, some evangelistic, what are we? Pentecostals don't believe that. But she got filled with the Holy Ghost. Spoke with tongues. Loved the Lord. Amen. She rubbed them beads and just worshiped Jesus. <laughs> but I worked with her and uh, she got filled with the Holy Ghost and she, uh, one night she was, uh, one evening, she was working the evening shift, and she started hemorrhaging. I'm talking about blood uh, just pouring out of her, her female organs, you know. And, and, and she just doubled over and fell on the floor. And we grabbed towels. Stuck, we're in, working in a hospital, right? So uh, we, we got a, a towels and, and just tried to keep her from bleeding out right there. Called the ambulance, you know, because I was working at the VA hospital, so you can't work on people there that are not veterans, so they had to take her to another hospital. You're 100 yards from the emergency room, you can't use it. Anyway, I mean, the people that the people that are supposed to use it can't use it. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. And uh, so, so anyway, uh, the ambulance people get there and they put her on there, you know, and they're just they're hanging blood and taking her into the uh, to the ambulance, and away they go. Woo, woo. And uh, well, you know, I laid hands on her and I said, "Now listen to me. I, I'm going to pray." So I laid hands on her, and prayed, believed God, rebuked the blood bleeding, commanded it to stop. Blah 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 blah. You know, and and away she goes out with the ambulance people. And uh, uh, calls me about three or four hours later. They got there, and they couldn't find anything wrong with her. And the guy in the emergency room said, if I didn't have these bloody towels, I would not believe your story. Now, amen. Now, here's the interesting thing. The VA tried to fire her for malingering on the job. That's a true story. <laughs> tried, tried to dock her for going to the hospital. Oh, my God. But we had bloody towels. Amen. But here's the whole point of that. After that, she got so fired up about the Word and about the Lord, she went to the Philippines, went to the leper colonies over there, laying hands on lepers and casting out devils, you know. She's on fire. She comes back. You know what she did? Went back to the Catholic Church. Because she just loved the tradition. It's just so comforting. Well, call them the next time you bleed out then. Come and sprinkle you with some water and bless you as you die. Come on. Anyway, now she's a sweet lady. But I was just amazed. Amazed. Amen. Some people just get pulled back by the draw of the world. When their pain goes away, so does their motivation. 
That's a biggie. Are you listening to me? When the pain stops, all of a sudden their desperation for God stops. Amen. Some people just have friends and relatives that they'd rather impress than be a crazy Christian person. Lots of those. And here's, here's a horrible truth. Some folks just plain lazy. Come on. So uh, think about that for a little bit. Just make that part of your meditation this week. When you're look, looking around at the, at the things that puzzle you about life, let this be one of them. Where are the nine? I mean, it's not the tenth one that I'm amazed at. I'm amazed at the nine. So, but notice this guy came back. He fell down at the Lord's feet. He worshiped him. He gave glory to God and thanked the Lord. Now, he's already cleansed. All ten of them were cleansed. But the Lord looked at this guy and said, Your faith has made you whole. Amen. There's more than just being cleansed or made free from symptoms. There's becoming whole. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I don't know uh, about you, but, but uh, I, I was delivered from alcoholism and drug addiction many, 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 many years ago. But I know so many folks, so many folks, that stop drinking and stop using, but they never get made whole. Now, I'm thinking this guy lost the scars of leprosy. Maybe some of those fingers that had been gnawed off by the rats, that's what happens to their fingers, you know, they don't really fall off from the leprosy. They get numb from the leprosy, and they, they don't know that their limbs are being eaten by varmints. Just thought I'd fill you in. Thought you needed to know that for your nightmares tonight. But uh, so these guys that have been hanging together with the other lepers, he, he probably didn't look all that good at this point. Sometimes they wear, you know, masks over their faces because they're all scarred. And uh, the uh, so the, the the lepers were generally speaking very, very, very scarred by their disease. He said this man was made whole. Amen. I, I talk to people all the time that come. And they get saved. They get filled with the Spirit. They know the Lord. And the, but they come from backgrounds, uh, oftentimes from abusive kinds of situations or, or where their daddy ran off and left them or they were raped by the, the neighborhood people. Or, you know, I mean, horrible stories. And yet they're 35 years down the line and they're still crying about it. You know, it still affects their relationships with other people, the people in their lives that they love, the people in their lives that love them. Uh, their ability to do things and to function in daily life. What does that mean? That means that they may have been cleansed, but they haven't been made whole. Amen. Hallelujah. How do you get whole? Once you realize you've been cleansed, you come back and fall at the Master's feet. Amen. There's a place of commitment and submission. There's a place of worship and glory to God. There's a place of giving thanks to the Lord. There's a place of living in service and worship of the Lord that only that process can make a person whole. Amen. Amen. There's more to the Christian life than just being symptom-free. You can be whole. Hallelujah. So, so that what happened to you is just history. I can tell my horror story. Amen. It doesn't bother me one iota. Amen. The things that tear me up now are the people that reached out to me and loved me when I wasn't whole. You know, looked past my scars and just loved me anyway. That makes me cry out of gratitude, just sheer gratitude. But I can tell the, sto the horror stories, and they're just stories. Stuff, it happened. Amen. Amen. And when you come back to the Master's feet, He makes you whole takes away the scars. You don't just patch them up. Amen. Let's stand up. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, just lift your hands up and worship him. Oh, Rabakashi Katari Beshiki. Oh, Ramakandari Beshika Talimasaka. Can you give me an E? 
situation where you know you've been healed but you're still hurt in the quickie places you still got those scars that won't let you completely walk free you need to be made whole if you want to take a little step of faith come on down here let me pray for you you need to be made whole tonight come let me pray for you hallelujah thank you Lord thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Hallelujah. This is not just a place that you're coming to tonight. This is a place He wants you to live. Hallelujah. On your face before Him. Amen. Let Him bring wholeness. Thank you. Thank you for taking a step of faith. Thank you for taking a step of faith. Thank you for taking a step of faith. Oh, Oh, Let's sing that little chorus again right now. say, you're my God, but you are so merciful. Thank you, Lord. You're all together lovely. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. grateful for being healed. Now, Lord, we want to be whole. 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 Hallelujah. Oh, Here I am. 
I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Just keep getting this praise. Let him fill you with wonder. Let him fill you with wonder. Let him fill you with wonder. Not questioning, but awe. Hallelujah. We ain't wondering. We're in awe. Oh, let him fill you. Let him lift your hands. Lift your hands. Just ask him to fill you with wonder. <laughs> Hallelujah. He is wonderful. Oh, he is wonderful. And the Bible says, you are filled with all the fullness of God. Hallelujah. Oh, filled with wonder. Filled with wonder. What a wonderful idea that the God of the universe would take up residence inside of me. Figure that out. That's just wonderful. That's just wonderful. That's just wonderful. That is just wonderful. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Father, we are in wonder tonight at the amazing goodness, the amazing grace, and the endless mercy of our God. We just thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. You're dismissed.